Okay, so I need some participation from the start. I need you to tell me some things that are common distractions, either in your life or in somebody around you in their life. So some common distractions. Cell what? Phones. Cell phones, thank you. <laughs> I was like, somebody's got to say that. Okay, cell phones, give me another distraction. Kids. <laughs> okay, okay, kids are a distraction, sure. <laughs> work, work is a distraction. Wait. Work is your work. <laughs> there we go. Yes, that's good. You're at work and you're like, work is such a distraction. <laughs> my game. <laughs> work is such a distraction to my cell phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I totally do. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let's try your best and rewind your brain to 50 to 100 years ago. What do you think would have been some common distractions 50 to 100 years ago? Yeah, we could say work and kids probably. What might be some other things? What predates the cell phone? <laughs> yeah. Animals. Okay. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> it's like anything is a distraction. <laughs> Trees are a distraction. <laughs> Squirrels. <laughs> okay, TV, TV was before. My dad had a black and white TV. I'm like... Wow, that's a, that's a while ago. <laughs> did, did, I think probably many of us grew up with like a, a tube TV, if you grew up with a TV. It's so crazy to think that that's not, my kids aren't going to ever know what a tube TV is. Heather, you had one. Yep. Yeah. How about the good old newspaper? <laughs> When's the last time you picked up like a full spread newspaper and you were like reading it? So distractions, the point is, distractions aren't new. We have had distractions since time in memoria, basically. And distractions are something we deal with very much today. But the only, and Jay kind of helped point towards this direction, but the only way you know a distraction is actually a distraction is if you know what you're supposed to be doing at that time. Because everything can be a distraction if it's at the wrong time. So a distraction presupposes that you know what you are supposed to be doing. I'm not sure we always do, though. So, like I mentioned earlier, my wife and I went camping with our kids last week, and some words came out of my mouth that I did not expect when we were camping. And they weren't swear words, okay? But we were around the, ki the, the kitchen table, there you go, the picnic table, and doing some dishes, and I said something to my daughters who were there making a mess, and I said, watch out! The whole point of this is to stay clean. The whole point of camping is to be clean. <laughs> I said something to that effect, which is, if you've ever been camping, you know that is not the point of camping. <laughs> if the point of camping was to stay clean, you wouldn't go camping. It's, it's kind of like the people that say in their company, safety is our number one priority. There is no company anywhere where safety is their number one priority, even a business that sells safety shoes. They're there to make a profit, or to accomplish an objective. And safety is a necessary part of accomplishing that so they can continue to accomplish it. But safety isn't why they're there. So what is the reason we're here is essentially the question. Back to distractions. How do you know cell phones are a distraction? How do you know children are a distraction? How do you know work is a distraction? Well, you're somehow, you're, you know that you're somehow supposed to be doing something different in that moment. So think of this. The phone ringing is not a distraction for a secretary whose job is to pick up the phone. It's not a distraction. That's, that's their job. Likewise, kids are not a distraction for somebody who is a parent who their job is to raise their children. A phone ringing, though, in the middle of an exam for a student totally is a distraction because it's taking them off task. So you get the idea. To know what a distraction is, you know, have to know what you're supposed to be doing, what your job is in that moment, and also tied to that, really, what your authority is in that moment. Who, who's your boss, right? So if your boss comes in and tells you, hey, I want you on this assignment, even if it's you know, kind of outside your regular job description, all of a sudden that becomes a priority and the other things become distractions. Now, God's word teaches us that God is our authority. You could say our boss. It wouldn't be unfair to say that he's so much more. He's our Lord. He's our King. But think of it this way. He's our authority. 
And he's actually called us to a mission that he expects us to commit to and to put away the distractions. He wants us to be laser focused on what he has called us to do. Now, here's the verse we're going to look at tonight. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. If you have a Bible, you can look there. It's a, a short passage. Uh, I'm actually going to read the verses just before it as well. So 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy, a guy that he is training and discipling. And he says, You then, my child, this is in verse 1, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will also be able to teach others. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And this, this next verse is our verse. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlists him. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, but his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So we need to be vigilant and on task is what Paul is reminding Timothy, and it's true for us as well. So we've been talking in this series about living in a sin-saturated world. Everywhere you turn, there is sin or the effects of sin. Today, I walked through the mall with my kids, and we had to return our router to uh, Kojiko, put it all up in a box. We get into the mall. We start walking through. I don't know if you've walked through the mall lately. It's like a disgusting place in terms of ads. It is hyper-sexualized. There's all kinds of false messaging going on. There's a new store coming in where the food court used to be in the mall that's called Envy and Grace Clothing. Envy and Grace Clothing. First of all, the word envy and grace should never be together in a brand name. And the word envy and clothing is like totally not a Christian thought. The, like, anyways, it's just, and then my daughters are like, that girl's really immodest because <laughs> she's wearing next to nothing on the, on the uh, thing. And I'm like, you are totally right. And then I'm like, why do you think people dress like that? And we have a little discussion about trying to get attention and approval and whatever else, right? We have a million sin-saturated things, but there's also in this world, and this is what I want to help us realize tonight, a million distractions. So distractions can be sinful, but distractions can actually be good things at the wrong time, wrong context. Scripture says there's a time and a season for everything. So when you're the student writing the exam and you're paying attention to the ringing phone, that's a distraction. But when you're the secretary, the ringing phone isn't a distraction. But there's a world of a thousand plus, well, millions of distractions. And I sense that even while previous societies were distracted, we are like hyper distracted because you can't drive down any road without there being billboards, 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 notifications, notifications, emails, all kinds of distractions coming at you from every side. Now, not all of them, as I mentioned, are bad, but they're bad when they take us off mission. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, since we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, this is to believers speaking about how they are surrounded by people that are faithful, let us therefore run with endurance the race set before us, laying aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. In that passage, it says, let us lay aside weight and sin. Two different categories of things. There's some things that are just wrong for every Christian everywhere all the time, and there's some things that are wrong for you in that moment. I brought up a few, a few uh, of my favorite things. I love tools. These aren't actually my tools, but I have the same ones at home, so I thought they'd do. These are the church's tools. Church has tools. They're great. I love looking through the flyers, looking through the Princess Auto flyer that just came today, and seeing the great deals on tools. Who names a store for guys Princess... I shouldn't say it's for guys. Princess Auto. Maybe it isn't for just guys. I just think it's tremendous marketing. It's a great uh, store. Lots of stuff. But these drills are great. However, just imagine trying to run a 5K walking with these or running with these. Like, I can hardly carry them now, much, re much less run a 5K. And any person who is thinking would not pack drills for a 5K race, much less a marathon. And this is 
kind of the idea we're getting at tonight. These things are excellent tools, really good. But when they're in the wrong context, they're actually holding you back. And I am hyper convinced in this room and in my life, there are things that are good. And I could make a a logical, moral argument that these aren't sinful things, but that these are actually holding me back from what God has called me to do. And so I want you to think about this. How do we remain on task? And then what is that task? Because that's going to help us to, to isolate what are distractions and what are not distractions, what are actually useful to our goal. Remembering, we want to lay aside weights and sins. So we're circling back to 2 Timothy 2, 4. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. I want you and each one of us to remember we are soldiers, not civilians when it comes to the kingdom of God. You have to realize your identity. Remember, you have a mission. You have a commander. You are engaged in a battle. You're not a civilian. And so that changes the way things are. It's not just anymore that you are an enemy. At one time, we were all enemies of Christ. We were opposed to the things of God. We were working against him. Now we've switched sides, but we've switched sides and we're not just in peacetime. We've actually switched sides and we are soldiers. Now we're not soldiers out to annihilate the enemy in terms of other people that are enemies of Christ right now. That's not our goal. (laughs) The weapons of our warfare are not, they are not bullets. They are truth in love presented to others. But thinking about our identity, we are soldiers for Christ. We are ambassadors. So your identity, who you are at the core, and more than your true identity, your perceived identity. Because once you become a Christian, you have a new identity, but you don't even realize all of your new identity. It's like you become no longer a member of this country, but you're a member of this country, but you don't realize all the benefits and blessings and what that all entails. So we have to understand our identity. And it's really quite important, not just what our actual identity is, but what we think our identity is. Hopefully you're tracking with me. Your identity. Do you think of yourself as a civilian in the kingdom of God or a soldier? I want you to think about this. Do you think of your identity in general in primarily in terms of your, uh, the things that can't change about you? I, that would be good in some ways. For example, God created us male and female. We aren't to change that. That's okay to be part of our identity. I don't know in eternity. I, I kind of assume I'll remain male. I don't know. I know there's not marriage in heaven. So maybe maleness and femaleness isn't in the new heavens and new earth. I kind of think it must be, but I don't know. The, there are other things though that are unchangeable that are part of my identity in terms of I can't change my age. I can't become older or younger. I guess I could do things that age me quickly, as they say, but you can't change your age, so that's okay. But how about this? Do you think of your identity in terms of your occupation? So when people ask, who are you? And you're like, I'm an engineer. I'm a delivery guy. I'm an accountant. I'm a fill in the blank. Do you think of that? Because that's not your real identity. That's part of what you do right now, but that's actually not your real identity. Do you think about your identity in terms of what others say about you? So others might have a high view of you, and so you ride on that high view, and you're like, well, I'm important because a lot of people say I'm important. So I'm the, the, the mayor, the local politician, and I got elected to this office, so I must be important. Or I'm the head of my company, so I must be important. Or you may say, well, I'm not important because all my friends have abandoned me. I'm not the head of this. I didn't win that, etc. Your identity should be formed primarily in thinking about what God says about you, who God says you are, because that does not change. So think about it this way. Not only is it wise to build your identity on who God says you are, because that's the truth, but it also sets you up so that you can't fall emotionally when your identity, other identities are challenged. So when you lose your job, it happens often in life. People will lose their job and they lose their sense of purpose, their sense of identity, because they had so much riding on their occupation. 
Now, it's not wrong to feel a sense of loss when you lo- lose a job because you, it's, it's not a nice and pleasant feeling. And God has created us men and women to work. And so we want to work. And if you don't have work right now, you might feel at a loss. And that's okay. But when, when so much is riding on your identity that you have to be in that job, in that place, that's really dangerous. How about if you're finding your identity in your family? Well, all of a sudden, a spouse or children or a parent dies and your whole identity has been shifted and threatened. Well, that should not be our identity others. So we think about our identity in terms of what God calls us. So I mentioned a soldier, but I'm going to rattle off a few other things that I want you to just hopefully affirm and say, yes, I agree. Maybe it's new to you, but yes, I agree. And you can look up scriptures later to confirm all these, but your identity, so who you are and who you should think of yourself as. You are created in the image of God. You are a citizen, if you're in Christ, you are a citizen of heaven. You are a child of God. You've been adopted by him, and guess what? He loses zero children. He never revokes an adoption. He doesn't adopt somebody and then say, actually, this is a trouble guy, get rid of him. He doesn't do that. You are accepted by God in Christ Jesus. You are chosen by God. um, That's pretty awesome. (laughs) I just like, you say it, oh, you're chosen by God. The God of the entire universe who could just as easily ignore you and forget about you because you're like a tiny, tiny, tiny speck of dust in the scheme of things has specifically chosen you. By name, he knows you. He knows every detail about you. I think that's awesome. You are God's special possession. You are an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador is a representative in another country, right? You are a doer of good works that he set aside for you. You're an heir with Christ. Like you get to inherit stuff that you didn't earn. It's like you all of a sudden became the brother of a really rich dude who's got a really, 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 really rich dad. And you're like, I get a cut in the inheritance? Sweet. That's to a tenth, like 10,000 times more what it means to be an heir with Christ. You are known and loved by God and you're a soldier for Christ that has been called out of the world. So Jesus says that he calls us out of the world. He doesn't call us out of the world to then make us look identical to the world and send us back in to basically not look at all different. So we should stand out from the world. That will be part of our identity, but it's because we look more and more like who God has designed us to be. So our identity, super important. Your false identity, things like your social status, your wealth, your popularity level, your grades, your spouse, your kids, your career, those things are all false identities. And if we're going to remain undistracted, we first and foremost need to remember what our primary identity is because otherwise we will exert so much effort fighting to protect those other identities, to protect them. So knowing our identity as a soldier and not a civilian changes our priorities. So like I mentioned with the the drills and a race, just imagine you're a soldier in an army and you want to be able to go to battle. You are not going to take the same things a civilian takes to furnish their house. You're not taking the lazy boy into the trenches, right? You just can't carry it. It doesn't make sense. You're not going to take the crock pot. You're maybe going to take a little cast iron skillet that you can cook some meals on and get what is done, needing to be done. You can also clock somebody over the head with it, I suppose. Crock pots are a little hard for that. Uh, You're going to do things completely different. You can't carry the same thing. So it's a distraction from our main occupation when we adopt the improper identity. So, we're Christians, we're all those things I said. So, what is actually our mission, our, our goal, our task? We talk about this often at Harvest, about it being to fulfill the Great Commission, to make disciples for God's glory. And we could add to do that in the spirit of the Great Commandment, which is to love one another as God has loved us. Here's what it's not. Here's the goals that we should not have primarily as our main objectives. Material things, building big houses, building houses that are small either uh, in terms of letting it all consume us. You know, my latest idol of sorts has been, oh, 
my wife and I would love property in the county. So we have a city property and it's a great spot, but it doesn't have the ability to raise chickens, <laughs> right? And then I was talking to her and I'm like, I don't think we want like a couple extra hundred thousand dollars of mortgage for chickens, for just chickens. <laughs> Maybe we should just break the rules and pay the bylaw fees. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just, I didn't do that. Just so you know. <laughs> um, but the idea being, you, get, you can get this, we need. Just think in your head, what do you right now, are you focusing on, I need, or I desire strongly? Those aren't necessarily bad, but just watch out, because they can be a source of distraction for what your mission is. And very quickly, you can find yourself pulled off. So materialism can be a huge snare. Do not love the things of the world, is what the, the gospel, or um, First John says, because those things can be a snare to your soul. Uh, Newsflash, if you haven't heard before, but there's nothing free aside from your salvation. <laughs> okay, so I'm, a, a, uh, I'm always tempted by good deals. Maybe you are too, and you see something on sale and you're like, this is a good deal. And it might be a good deal. The best deals are when people hand you stuff for free and you're like, this is amazing, it's free. But it's not free. It's never free because that thing that you've been given now has to occupy a place in your home. It has to occupy a place in your garage. So it has taken up space. And whether you know it or not, you're paying storage fees for it by housing this thing. And eventually you get so much stuff, you're like, oh, we need a bigger house. Well, it's not really that you necessarily need a bigger house. It's just you've now got all this stuff. So you, you, you buy a, a trailer of some sort, and now you're like, I got to store it somewhere, right? You buy a vehicle, you buy a second vehicle, all these things. They're all maybe useful, but they become things that latch on to you. And the more and more of those things you have, it tends to be the more and more consumed with them you are. You now have to store it, clean it, maintain it, fix it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So watching out for the, the snare materialism can be to us. Now, you can have a lot of things and it's not a sin when you hold on to them loosely and when they don't distract you from your main objective. Sometimes having those things allows you to share with others. That's a great thing. But know what's going on, paying attention to what your main objective is, not to just acquire more toys, but to use those things to advance God's kingdom. How about this? A soldier needs to be flexible to be deployed. How flexible are you to be deployed wherever God wants you right now? There's a lot of things that make you inflexible to being deployed. I remember in college talking to a mission agency because I was interested in foreign missions, just kind of exploring what God had for us. And the very first question they asked me when I said, I'm interested in missions, they said, do you have debt? Don't you want to know like whether I can speak Spanish or something? I don't know, like another language, but they're like, no, do you have debt? Because you can't go to the mission field with debt. They will not take you. And I was like, man, Debt is a huge distraction from obedience to what God wants you to do. Now, sometimes you have to be in debt necessarily, or, well, not necessarily. I shouldn't say you have to be in debt. That's not true. You can take our Dave Ramsey course for what good debt and bad debt in terms of like owning a house and having a mortgage. But there's a whole lot of what we would call like consumer debt that's totally just a distraction because we wanted more things to store, to now maintain, to keep, to become a snare to our soul. <laughs> and we actually end up with more and more distraction. How about this though? Family connections can be a distraction. This is a double-edged sword because family connections are a priority in the Christian faith. If you don't provide for your own family the way you're supposed to, you're in huge trouble because you're worse than an unbeliever, it says worse than a pagan. Now, providing for your family does not mean a grandparent has to be in the same city as their grandchild having them over every weekend. There are times when you need to leave your family to serve God in a different context or to be flexible. So again, that can, that can be a huge good thing that becomes a distraction Okay, it's not sin. Family's not sin. Family's a blessing and a gift. But is it holding us from accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish? I, I'm so thankful when I hear of family members that give each other the freedom to serve. 
So years ago, when my dad called me and said, I know you're hours away from home, and for several years that was a really difficult thing in our relationship, and he's like, I know you're where you need to be, and basically gave his blessing to being hours away, and it freed me up so much because I'm like, now I don't have this feeling of like, oh, I need to be there too. I'm supposed to be here, and so it's a beautiful thing. So if you're holding back somebody from what they're supposed to be doing, give them freedom, and if you have people holding you back from what you're supposed to be doing, Remind yourself that your loyalty to Christ comes before your loyalty to family. However, don't use that as the get out of, get out of responsibility card. If you're a dad with young kids and you're like, I'm leaving them with my wife and I'm going overseas missions for three years. See you later. Just take care of them. You might be uh, missing something there. Okay. How about this? A huge distraction is bitterness over past hurts. This one just came to me as I was sitting here because... So often in life, I have had things that I hold on to and it doesn't, no no good. All it does is occupy RAM or a memory space in my brain, but it doesn't advance anything useful. But it's just like, oh, that situation, oh, that situation, oh, that situation. Let it go. Let it go. Now, this doesn't mean we gloss over sin and pretend nobody sinned ever in the past, but don't let bitterness hold you back from what God calls you to do. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it be this recurring theme. That's where forgiveness is so powerful because we can forgive. Doesn't mean we don't have consequences for sin, but we can forgive and we can not, not hold those things against people. We want to remain on task when we remember we're not civilians, we are soldiers. We have an identity. We've been called into service. And the next point is that we've been called into service by someone by God himself. And our job while in his service is to please him. So how do you know what your aim is? And how do you know what the distractions are? Well, you got to know your soldier, you're in God's army, and you need to know he's your authority. He's the one who gives you marching orders. Your aim is to please him, it says. The aim is to please the one who enlisted him. You can't imagine. Well, you can imagine, I suppose, but imagine you have a, a soldier And the commanding officer gives orders and he's like, yeah, well, whatever, I'm doing what I want to do. If you know anything about military culture, you know that doesn't get, that doesn't pass (laughs) because the whole military functions on authority structures and obedience to those authority structures and insubordination is hugely problematic. Similarly, in the Christian kingdom, God is the authority and we march to his orders. So what pleases God is the next question that kind of enters my mind. What, what actually makes God pleased? Fortunately, he makes it pretty obvious for us. He made it obvious through a whole list of commandments to be obedient to. And then he made it really easy for us and he summarized them in two commandments. He summarized the whole law in two. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When you get those two things right and you think about how to apply them, you get it. That's what pleases God. It's actually not burdensome, Scripture says. It's actually a delight when we do it. So what pleases him? He, it pleases him when he, we love the way he has called us to love. Me as a dad, when my kids get along and you see one of them serving another, which is a beautiful thing. If you've ever seen kids do this, if you've seen nephews and nieces or your own kids do this, you're like, that is, this is a little slice of heaven. Like they just actually helped one another. That's awesome. Just imagine how much more so it is for God looking down and seeing us when we actually are truly others oriented, when we are sacrificially thinking about the good of somebody else here tonight. You're like, in your mind, you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to think about their good before my good. And I'm going to sacrifice my time my talents, my finances, to see their good achieved. That just makes God incredibly pleased because that's what his word teaches us. And so that's what the aim of a soldier. Now, when we love our enemies, when we speak the truth to our enemies in love, God is delighted. He loves that because we are then fu- functioning as his ambassadors, as a representative of, of Christ. We are also reminded here of who our authority is and how we measure success. So a big question for me, maybe it is for you, 
was my day successful? Did you have a good day? My wife will ask. Well, what is a good day? How do you know if you had a good day? Is a good day when you got a raise? Is a good day when you got your whole to-do list done? <laughs> Which, that never happens. Uh, is a good day when you just physically feel great? What is a good day? God tells us what a good day is. Just ask him at the end of the day, hey, Lord, was this a good day? First of all, every day that you're asking that question, it's a good day because <laughs> you're on the right track, right train of thinking. But you can know if a day is good by whether you did what pleased him. So thinking about your work, did you do work that brings glory to him, that is good work, that is quality work, that other people would look at and say, that's good work. Doesn't mean it has to, just at the, on the weekend, I was at a, a, a mini conference and the speaker reminded me, he's like, you don't have to write a Bible verse on every cupcake you make as a cupcake baker in order for it to be a, a good cupcake, right? You don't, if you're a shoe salesman, you don't have to like write Bible verses on the bottom of every shoe in order for it to be a good shoe. Quality is an important thing. So if you are a, a, a framer and you frame a good structurally sound wall that's within the dimensions of the blueprint, good job. If you're an accountant and the balance sheet, you balance the sheets out, great. If you are a landscaper and you actually edge all the grass nice, that's great. That's doing your work as unto the Lord, doing it in a quality way. You are, you are able to check off at the end of the day, hey, I did my work as unto the Lord. It was successful. But this is where I would encourage you, daily walk with God. So we know the general call of Christians, right? So we know in general, Christians are to love one another. They're to obey God's commandments. They're to uh, spread the gospel, right? They're supposed to fulfill the Great Commission. That looks totally different in each of our contexts. We have different ways of accomplishing those. So it's so important that you actually dialogue with God the Father through Jesus Christ daily and say, maybe even at the beginning of the day, Lord, what do you want from today? I know I've got this meeting. How do you want me to handle it? I've got this. How do you want me to go about it? Maybe I've got a blank slate of a day. What do you want filled in? And then step forward and make those decisions with the purpose of glorifying God. Now, sometimes you're going to have opportunities come up that seem like distractions in the moment that aren't distractions. Okay, so we've been talking about your, your macro purpose. When you keep that in mind that you're desire is to glorify God by loving others, by loving him, you're going to interpret opportunities as either opportunities or distractions. So think of Jesus when he is ministering. He's ministering, going about his thing, and some people bring children to him. And this is what scripture says. It's kind of an interesting passage. They were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. The disciples thought this was a distraction. They're like, kids interrupting the speaker? Take them out. Get them out of the service. Put them in the nursery, <laughs> right? Take them out. They're distracting the speaker. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. In that moment, the disciples thought an opportunity was a distraction and Jesus saw it and said, no, this is actually something that's meant to happen. So in our life, you got to just be watchful because there's distractions that will happen or interruptions, we'll call them, that are actually opportunities, not distractions. So I had it a couple weeks ago. I'm working on my to-do list in the office and I hear a knock at the door and an unscheduled visitor pops in and I have to make a decision, is this... There are some of those unscheduled visitors that are actually a distraction because it's not, they're there every week. And you're like, no, thank you. That was unscheduled. Please make a schedule. Please come in when you call or go to your small group leader, that kind of thing. But this was a genuine opportunity. And afterwards, I was so thankful for that interruption that was not a distraction, but it was an opportunity. Okay, so we, we know our identity, we know our aim is to please God, and then finally we lay aside the weights, which I've mentioned several times already, but Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, not just the sinful things, but also the good things that don't need to be in your life to accomplish your mission. So think about this. A guy named Daniel 
uh, J. Levitinen, in The Organized Mind, a book that he wrote, says this, The Roman philosopher Seneca the Younger, who was a tutor to Nero, complained that his peers were wasting time and money accumulating too many books, admonishing that the abundance of books is a distraction. So this guy is super concerned. He's like, there's so many books. There's so many books. It's such a distraction. Instead, Seneca recommended focusing on a limited number of good books to be read thoroughly and repeatedly. I thought this was so interesting, even that way back then, people were thinking, there's so many distractions. You've got to pare it down, be focused, focus on what is good. So thinking today about Christians and the distractions we have, I have never thought about my library of books as being a distraction, mostly because I don't read enough of them, right? Because there's other distractions that have taken the place. But what are some distractions? We mentioned some earlier. Entertainment. Even wholesome entertainment. A lot of times we talk about entertainment, we're like, don't watch the bad stuff, right? Get out all the bad. Get in pure flex or something, right? That's like the, the good stuff. And even that can be a distraction. Entertainment. Think about this. We were made to be creative beings, not just consumers. In our culture, one of the greatest threats to our, our, our humanity is that we are taught to only consume. It's okay to consume. God has made us to be able to take in the beauty of the world, the creative arts of others. But if you look at your your entertainment, you're like, I consume way more than I create, there's probably a, a problem. It's probably not healthy. So try your hand at writing a short story for somebody. Try your hand at music. Try your hand at creating something, anything, baking, building, whatever it is. Try creating for others to be able to consume rather than just consuming the one package thing that everybody's consuming. Be careful of that. Entertainment can be a distraction. How about this? Solo athletics. So athletics, even going to the gym, can be a really redemptive thing, good thing. The Bible says bodily training is of some value, but godliness is of great value. So if your bodily training is getting in the way of other things, redeem it or find a way to use it for God's glory. So exercise with somebody and all of a sudden use it in a, a useful way. Maybe exercising while listening to, um, to things that can, can build your mind up, right? Those can be useful things. How about purposeless ministry? This is a huge distraction. This is probably the most dangerous distraction because people think I'm doing something good for Jesus, but it's actually just spinning tires. It's like not getting traction, not going anywhere. This is the kind of ministry that people just are like, oh, we've always done it. We've always done it. We've always done it. I am actively considering in Harvest Connect, what is the outcome of this ministry? Because if it just is going to be a whole bunch of people coming together on Monday night, leaving, and there's nothing changed, no relationships built, there's no fruit being born spiritually, then we'll be like, shut it down. We'll start something else. Let's find out where the outcomes are that we're going for for God's glory. So purposeless ministry is dangerous. Don't just do stuff for the sake of doing stuff. Uh, one time, a, uh, a pastor was telling me, he's like, imagine you're swinging an ax at a tree. I think it was a, the, the passage in scripture where the ax head falls off, actually. And he's like, imagine the ax head falls off the ax, and the guy's like, and he just keeps whacking the tree. He's like looking like he's busy, but there's no point on it. We could totally do that. Do not do that in ministry. Don't be purposeless. And here's one I thought I'd, I thought I'd end with. <laughs> Pointless debates, <laughs> okay? There's a lot of pointless debates. There's a lot of pointless debates. There are a lot of people just looking for a fight to talk about stuff, but they aren't interested in actually putting into practice what they even believe. Watch out for that. Don't get pulled into it. Don't waste your time pouring your pearls before swine. You can make good debates, good arguments, that's fine, but just watch out for the pointless ones, the ones where you're like, this is clearly not going anywhere and not redemptive because you can end up wasting your time. So a reminder of our mission. Overall, we're a soldier, not a civilian. We've got an aim to please God, and we want to lay aside all the weights so that we can glorify God in making disciples, bear fruit, and love as he loves love. We have, Scripture says, about 70 years of life. We'll take the average age here to be 30, 35, let's say. Now, if you have 35 years left of your life, you have 1,200 
or 12,783 days left. That's being generous, because some of us won't get that. 12,783 days, which is 306,000 hours. That's not a lot. It's not a lot. I don't want you or I to wake up 40 years from now and be like, what did I do with my life? I watched Facebook Reels, except then it'll be X Reels, not Twitter Reels or whatever the, the newest company is. It'll be Threads or whatever, right? Please, let's do something more with our life for God's glory. John Piper says it well, don't waste your life. We don't want to waste your life. We want to use it for his glory, which means not being distracted from our mission.